Okay, so welcome back. We had a question uh, when we broke. Uh, Nikita wanted to know what happens if there is a pinning. It will change the temperature and therefore the density. Right? But then I always have uh, this uh, difference between the layers. So, but uh, there is a meaning uh, if uh, there is a pressure difference on top of the uh, surface. Uh, if there is a pairing, will it affect this pressure difference, the arrangement of the density pressure difference? It does. For example, when you look at the picture we have here, uh, you have upwelling out here and therefore sea level decreases. So wherever the thermocline or pycnocline comes up, the sea level drops. Wherever the thermocline or pycnocline goes down, the sea level goes up. So that is it. So if you look at the Gulf Stream, you will see the sea level increasing from the US coast offshore. That's all. In the southern hemisphere, as you would expect, all signs are reversed. You have high pressure to the right in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, you have high pressure to the left. That's it. <coughs> okay, so you have uh, Ekman flows with the flow being at, uh, at, uh, at right angles to the applied wind stress to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere. Your geostrophy, so you have uh, flow along an isobar, that's what you will see here. In this case, you have uh, the flow into the board, into the laptop plane, and uh, isobars would be again normal to the same surface. So you have flow along an isobar, you have flow with the high pressure to the right in the northern hemisphere, high pressure to the left in the southern hemisphere. And the other thing you have is uh, this baroclinic compensation with depth where this pressure gradient at the surface has to be compensated as you go down because of stratification and that is the only way you get this level of no motion that is what happens so it's the stratification in the oceans that enables this level of no motion to exist right so that is why we study the so-called noise and uh, we are not interested in the signal so now we let's look at uh, the theory that has been put forth to explain uh, the kind of circulation that uh, we saw yesterday. <laughs> There's a climatology of sea surface temperature from the Levitas Atlas. What you will see is that there is a strong equator to pole temperature gradient, but uh, there's also something else. You find east-west contrast striking across the Pacific, not as striking in the other basins. But uh, um, you have here what's called the Indo-Pacific uh, warm pool. The warmest waters of the tropical oceans lie out here. And uh, this is where you find more of rising air. And since it is warm, the temperature is above uh, 28 degrees Celsius typically. Convection in the atmosphere is possible. Data show that uh, there is some rough threshold below which convection does not occur. The threshold seems to be around 28 degrees Celsius for the Indian Ocean and roughly that for the Pacific part of the warm pool. And it's lower in the hurricane generating region in the Atlantic. It's maybe around 26 to 27 degrees Celsius. But there is a rough threshold below which convection is suppressed. When temperatures above that, convection can occur. and uh, it does not matter how much above that threshold the temperature is. There is no relation once the threshold is crossed. <coughs> so these are the regions where you would expect uh, rising motion. Now let's go back to a picture that's more uh, from school geography. We look first at the 2D picture below here, this uh, circle with air converging towards the equator. That's the warm part. But as the air flows towards the equator, it is deflected towards the right in the northern hemisphere, towards the left in the southern hemisphere, Coriolis acceleration. So you have the northeasterly and southeasterly trades. Now this is an exaggeration. The winds are more easterly than 
northeasterly or southeasterly. So it's a zonal component or the east-west component that is much stronger. And here you have uh, the subtropical deserts. Most of the world's deserts are located in the subtropics, whether you're talking of the Sahara or the Gobi deserts of China and so on, and similarly in the southern hemisphere. The African deserts of Kalahari, the deserts of Chile and Argentina, and again in Australia. So this is where you expect air to rise. Sorry, air to sink. So you have uh, air sinking in these regions, therefore you don't have convection. And uh, there is again a low pressure once you come towards the Arctic and Antarctic circles. So you have westerly winds now. You have air flowing from this subtropical high pressure to the polar low pressure. And when that happens, again the flow is deflected towards the right in the northern hemisphere, towards the left in the southern hemisphere, and you get westerly winds in both hemispheres. So you have the easterly trades, you have the westerlies to the north of the trades. And then you have convergence again into the low pressure zone here from the polar highs. Subpolar lows and polar highs. So if you were to look at a 3D picture, you have air rising at the equator, sinking in the subtropical highs. You have the sinking motion there, driven also by the uh, rising air in the subpolar lows. And uh, this is the kind of circulation you get. So we were looking here at the surface component. There is a reverse motion in the upper atmosphere. Now, of interest to us is one more thing. When you look at uh, these uh, trades and the westerlies, if you were to take a cross section here, uh, what you see is that you have these trade winds blowing from east to west. In the atmosphere, easterly means from the east. In the ocean, we will typically talk of eastward or westward currents, which means towards rather than from. But in the atmosphere, the direction is uh, uh, it's from. So when you say easterly, you mean from east. So you have the easterly trades and you have the westerlies to the north. And you can see that you will get a curl if you were to compute the curl field. You get a non-zero curl out here okay, between the westerlies and the easterlies. And this is a region of the subtropics where you find the jars. If you look at a vertical section, you have rising air at the equator. This is called the intertropical convergence zone. You have sinking motion in the subtropical highs. This is the subpolar lows. So you have rising motion again over there and sinking in the subtropical highs. So you might have cumulus convection, low clouds out here, but then there is sinking of air above that and uh, that suppresses the convection. So out here at the equator, you can have deep convective clouds giving rains. And uh, out here in the subtropical deserts, you might find shallow clouds, but uh, they give you no rain. So this is the uh, vertical section of the atmospheric circulation. <coughs> it glosses over many uh, aspects. As we saw here, you have an east-west asymmetry in the Pacific. We are not going to worry about that for now. What we are talking of is a symmetric uh, part of the circulation because that is what is of interest to us if we want to explain the kind of ocean circulation we have seen in the uh, slides yesterday. Okay. Now, this particular part of the wind circulation, which is the convergence towards the equator, rising air at the equator, poleward motion at uh, the, in the upper troposphere and sinking at the subtropical highs. This part of the circulation is called the Hadley cell or Hadley circulation. The other part here is called the feral cell, the cell associated with the westerlies to the north of the easterly trades. This is a rainfall climatology from the Trim uh, Tropical Rainfall Measuring Missions climatology. This is from January to December 98 to 2000. And uh, you see that uh, you have higher rainfall towards the equator than away from it. But the Indian Ocean, as uh, you expect, is different. This is an annual average, and it averages over the summer and winter monsoons. And the summer monsoon, we know that we get rainfall over India. So there's a difference again, driven by the seasonal cycle of the monsoons in this part of the world oceans. There's also a north-south asymmetry in the Pacific. This convergence zone is not located at the equator, but slightly north of it on average. 
But uh, if you ignore that, you basically have a system which is more or less symmetric in the Pacific and very different in the northern part of the Indian Ocean. <coughs> These are winds and rainfall for uh, March. So you have uh, the equinox here when the sun is overhead at the equator and uh, the convergence zone which has high rainfall given by these colors is located at the equator. You also have a patch out here and you can see clearly that there's an east-west asymmetry across the Pacific that we are ignoring in our uh, analysis of uh, subtropical gyres. It's not uh, uh, much consequence for what we are going to be interested in. When you look at uh, January, this is where it is during the winter solstice, winter in the northern hemisphere. It's roughly at the equator. But in July, the Pacific band moves a little farther north following the sun, the rainfall band, and the winds converge towards that. So when you look at January, the winds converge into this rainfall band, and when you look at uh, July, the winds converge into the band that has moved a little farther north because the sun has moved north. June is the time when you have the summer solstice. But look at what happens over India. Nowhere else in the world oceans do you see such a large migration of this convergence band. In January, it's out here. In July, it's sitting in the northern Bay of Bengal. So when you look at the Pacific or the Atlantic, <coughs> you can talk in terms of those semi-permanent subtropical gyres dominating the circulation. The direction does not change with season. You can expect that with the convergence zone moving so far north, it's practically at the subtropical latitudes out here in the Bay of Bengal in July. You expect convergence into the uh, region of high rainfall because that's where the pressure is lowest now. And when that happens, you have air rising out here and it will sink at the equator. So this is a huge reversal of the Hadley circulation. This happens only over the northern part of the Indian Ocean. So in the Indian Ocean, Northern Indian Ocean, one fundamental reason why when we were looking at the circulation, we looked at five basins and not this one, is that in the other five basins, the mean circulation is what dominates at the lowest order, if you were to look at it in some terms of a series expansion. And in the Indian Ocean, Northern Indian Ocean, it's the season cycle that dominates. So in the Northern Indian Ocean, the seasonal cycle is more important than the mean, which is much weaker. In the other five basins, it is different. That's why we're going to look at the other five basins first and then look uh, in greater detail at what happens in the region of interest to us. <coughs> this is a view from of the globe. Um, two diametrically opposite views. Now this is uh, January and this is July. So you can see that there is a migration in the Pacific too, but nothing compared to what happens in the Indian Ocean, especially the Bay of Bengal. You can see the winds converging into this uh, rainy region over the northern bay because that is where you expect the pressure to be lowest. So in the Indian Ocean you have a very large migration of this convergence zone and uh, there are times when you actually see two convergence zones, one lying at the equator and one lying uh, in the bay. You can't have uh, air converging into both convergence zones from uh, the two hemispheres, it's not possible. That's why uh, some prefer to call this the tropical convergence zone rather than the intertropical convergence zone. Intertropical convergence zone makes sense if you have it roughly straddling the equator and air converging into it from the two hemispheres. Uh, but if you have it located exclusively in one hemisphere, the way it is in July over the Bay of Bengal, then uh, the air converging into it uh, partly comes from the southern part, but then a lot of it is being driven from across the Arabian Sea. So you have one convergence zone sitting here and there may be a weaker one sitting in uh, over the equatorial Indian Ocean at the same time. So it doesn't make much sense to call it the IT season. So some people prefer to call it the T season, dropping the I. Okay, <laughs> now this entire thing of the subtropical gyres was explained in five years following World War II. The first solution was offered by Harald Swedro, a Norwegian oceanographer, after whom the unit of transport is named. Uh, we saw that yesterday, the transport of the Gulf Stream, we said, is over 150 Swedroops. 
uh, Swedrup is a million cubic meters per second. So Swedrup offered his solution in 1946, 31 years after Ekman's uh, paper on uh, the boundary layer that has been called the Ekman layer. <coughs> now when Ekman calculated, uh, did his calculation, he ignored the pressure gradient. So he got a vertical structure which is very difficult to see in the oceans. Swedrup took a different approach. He retained the pressure gradient, but in order to make simplifications that gave him a solution, he dropped the vertical structure. He was no longer interested in that. He integrated in the vertical and therefore got the sum of the Ekman and geostrophic fields. So he's no longer going to be able to tell you what is happening at any given depth, unlike the classical Ekman spiral. What he can tell you is what happens to the transport integrated over some depth range. <clears throat> so he's lost the vertical uh, detail, but he has been able to retain pressure gradient. And as it turns out, that is critical if you want to explain why the gyre exists. Swedrup got a first order equation in x, <clears throat> that is the east-west coordinate, and solved it. The first order equation can be in V or pressure. <clears throat> His solution was very simple. Beta is the rate of change of the Coriolis acceleration with latitude, and V is the north-south transport. So beta into V, beta is a constant. Yeah, <clears throat> because uh, the way this uh, set of equations is solved is you don't look at the Earth as a sphere. You account for its velocity by using this term beta, which allows the Coriolis acceleration to ch change with latitude, but <coughs> you linearize this change, which is basically going as sine theta, about some central latitude. So in this case, it will be 30 degrees north, because that is a central latitude. You have the westerly winds to the north of 30 degrees, and you have uh, easterlies to the south of 30 degrees. So that is how the solution has been obtained. <coughs> so you have this curl of wind stress. Tau here is the wind stress on the right hand side, the curl of the wind stress. And this is a very local thing. The curl of the wind stress is local to any given location. What it tells you is that the curl of the wind stress gives me the transport at that location. So if I were to look at, uh, say, 30 north, all I need to know at any given longitude is the local curl of the wind. And if I know that, I know what is the equator word transport at that uh, longitude. So there is negative or anticyclonic curl of wind stress because of the westerlies and the easterlies. You can uh, look at this. This is anticyclonic or negative curl that you will get. And that forces an equator word drift across the basin. If your curl is negative, beta is always positive. So you get V to be negative. So Swedrup gets you the equator word drift across the entire basin. And the western boundary transport then is the transport that is required to close the separation. Now Swedrup has a first order equation to solve. So a priori, there is no way to decide whether you are going to integrate that equation from the east or from the west. If you integrate from the west, you get this boundary current from the eastern side. You get an equator word drift that has to be compensated by the return flow, which is the boundary current. So what is being obtained here is the so-called return flow associated with the boundary current. That is equator wave. Where the boundary current exists, Swedrup cannot tell. Why is it on the western side? In <clears throat> order to get the western boundary current on the uh, correct side, that is at the western boundary, the integral was carried out from east to west. But there is no real reason to do that. You could as well carry out the integral from west to east. But if you did that, the compensating flow for this equator wave uh, drift would be at the eastern boundary. That is not what the observation showed. That's why Swedrup carried out his integral from his tools. Okay. So he's not only lost the vertical structure, he is also in the process of simplifying his equations, <clears throat> left out something which does not tell him why the current is at the western boundary. Note that he does have this so-called beta effect. In that he has linearized the change in Coriolis acceleration about a central latitude. So at the central latitude, f is set to f0, calculated from 2 omega sine theta0. But f is now equal to f0 plus beta into y. 
beta being evaluated at the central latitude and y is the distance from this latitude 30 degrees. So y is positive to the north of 30 degrees and y is negative to the south of 30 degrees. So you will have f increasing to the north of the central latitude and decreasing to the south. So this uh, change in Coriolis acceleration is there. But what you do not have is uh, <coughs> uh, enough complexity to tell you why the current, the boundary current lies on the western side. Okay, But this is still remarkable. It, all you need to know is the local curl of wind and you get the equator wind transport at that location. Now if you integrate that transport all across the basin, the western boundary transport is what is required to balance it. So there is a catch here. How does the western boundary know how much has to be transported in order to balance what is being transported across the basin? There is no connection because this is a steady solution. There is something happening here and the western boundary current knows what is happening all over the basin and transports exactly the amount needed to close the loop. Now suppose I were to carry out a small perturbation of this curve. Say I impose a small seasonal cycle. What happens? There is nothing in the sweat rope solution that tells you what happens. Does the western boundary current react immediately? Does it take some time? And if so, what is the process by which the changes in the basin are communicated to the western boundary? There is nothing in the sweat rope solution that tells you that. <coughs> the next remarkable development was courtesy Henry Stommel in 1948, two years after sweat rope. Stommel carried out three kinds of calculations. He looked at first a non-rotating earth and he got a nearly level sea surface. In the second experiment, he had a constant Coriolis acceleration f. He had higher sea level at the center but symmetrical flow around it. Then he put in the beta effect, the latitudinal variation called the Coriolis acceleration. Note that Swedrup had it, but not in a form that gave the westward intensification. In the case of the Stommel solution, the boundary current naturally appears in the west and it is a consequence of this beta effect. So there is something in the Swedrup solution that does not account for the intensification occurring on the western boundary. He basically has a first order equation. He has simplified his momentum equations to a point where when he combines them with the mass balance equation, he gets only a first order equation. So when you have a first order equation, you can satisfy only one boundary condition. He has a first order equation in x, so he can satisfy the boundary condition either at east or west. He chooses to satisfy it on the eastern side because that is the only way he can get the boundary transport on the western side. Everything else is local. You tell me what is the curl of wind stress at any given location, I can tell you what is the equator word transport at that location. And the western boundary current is just what you need to balance out the basin wide equator word transport. But whether it should be on the east or the west, you can't tell because you can as well integrate from west to east. Mathematically, there's nothing to stop you from doing it either way. So Stommel includes something that allows him to get the western boundary current on the other side, on the right side. Okay, so uh, he brought in uh, friction, but not in a complex uh, form, not in the form that we usually use it. We use it in the Laplacian form, that is the second derivative of the, uh, we use it as a del squared term. So he didn't include that, he used it in a very different form, it's something like bottom friction. But uh, now he could solve better than Swedrup did. He built on Swedrup solution because now one part was explained why the equator word drift is uh, there at all. It's linked to the curl of wind stress, so that is not changing here. What is changing is that now he has uh, got two boundary conditions on both east and west and now he can naturally satisfy the condition on both sides and he ends up with the solution that gives him the intensification naturally on the western side and it turns out that it is because of the change in Coriolis acceleration with latitude called the beta effect. Two years later in 1950 Walter Monk brought in forcing by realistic winds and he had more realistic friction. 
So he had a fourth order equation. So now he can satisfy two conditions on the east and two conditions on the west when you have a fourth order equation. So he can satisfy the flow of no normal flow into the boundary, which Swedrup could do only at the eastern boundary and Stommel could do at the eastern and western boundaries. But now since he has a Laplacian friction, he can satisfy the no slip condition at the eastern and western boundaries. So he has a fourth order equation. You basically end up by doubling the order because you have uh, friction terms for both you and me. And uh, he ends up with a fourth order equation and this solution is fairly realistic. It allows the counter current, that is the equator word flow to exist just east of the western boundary current, just as you see in the observations. Now, the problem with the Munn solution was uh, basically that it did not produce the expected transport. But then you also have to understand that he was using realistic winds, but in 1950 there were no satellites. There was no scattermeter. So the winds were based on ship observations and there was uh, sparsity of data. When you have sparse data, calculating derivatives is a problem. Integrals are not too bad, but derivatives are always a problem. So you're always going to underestimate the curl of the winds. If you underestimate the curl of the wind, the federal solution tells you that you will underestimate the equator of drift. If you underestimate the equator of drift, no matter how complex your uh, mathematical model, you are always going to underestimate the western boundary transport. And that is what happened with Monk. But later he and George Carrier solved it for a more realistic uh, basin geometry, the triangular shape of the Pacific narrowing towards the north. And uh, they could show that I mean, you get uh, values that are reasonable. It's still smaller than observed, the transport, but uh, something remarkable has been achieved. You get the gyres, you get the western boundary current, you get the eastern boundary current, you get the strong return flow just east of the boundary current. So in just five years, basically what was sought to be explained, the essential physics of the subtropical gyres was put in place. So, we summarize for the global ocean. Geophysical flows are different from classical fluid flows. We have a very low aspect ratio. We have basically a thin fluid, but non-friction. Friction is important in the sense that when you come close to boundaries, as the Monk solution shows, friction is useful. You have to put that in. But as long as you are in the interior of the ocean, friction is not important. You have boundary layers, like the surface mix layer, where the wind blows where friction comes into play and that is why you have the Tickman spiral. But it is different from the kind of friction that you will encounter if you took two plates in the lab that gave you a similar aspect ratio, where friction would dominate the circulation. Here it does not. There is sphericity and rotation, cannot be ignored again, and there is stable stratification. So when you look at the global ocean circulation, you have semi-permanent subtropical gyres with intense western boundary currents. They are permanent in direction, there is a closed loop, and the semi is because the magnitude of transport can change in time. It can change within a season, with season, or across years. But direction of the Gulf Stream, for example, does not change. All these solutions we have been talking about, from Swedrup to Monk, are steady state solutions. So if I were to perturb something in the interior, if I were to change the curl of the wind stress, how does the western boundary current know? There's nothing in the solutions to tell you that. You could look at the steady state solutions as the t tending to infinity limit of a Laplace transform. So you take the unsteady equations, which is what we normally solve, take the Laplace transform, look at the infinity limit in time, and uh, you get the steady state solution. That's one way of looking at the solutions. But there is a transient in between. Just as when the wind blows, there is a finite time it takes for the equin flow to set in. Or you tilt the sea surface, there is a time it takes for the geostrophic balance to set in. Likewise, you put up the curl of wind stress in the interior, there must be a finite time before the western boundary current will respond to it. There must be some means to communicate the signal from the interior of the Atlantic to the east coast of the United States. It cannot be instantaneous. So that is the transition, the transient solution. We are ignoring that here. <coughs> this semi-permanent subtropical gyre is forced by the curl of the wind stress in the interior ocean and the sphericity of the earth and its rotation 
lead to strong western current, strong currents at the western boundary. So that is basically what we see in five ocean basins. Our problem is that our interest is in the Indian Ocean, and you cannot describe the winds with one picture. If you were to look at uh, the Indian Ocean, you look at the SST. This is January and May. You see the change from the equator. The warming has spread. The warmer areas are in the north, and in July, again very different. In fact, the equator is now no longer as warm as uh, some parts of the European Gulf, which is not what you see in the Pacific. The shift in the warm band is not as much in the Pacific. So this is striking difference when you look at the Indian Ocean, and the wind has to respond to this. One immediate consequence is that none of the steady state theories is directly applicable. So the solutions of Swedrop, Stommel, and Mung give you some ideas, but they cannot be applied. Why? Because the changes that you see with season dominate the mean circulation. The mean wind is not as strong in the northern Indian Ocean as is the seasonal cycle of the winds. So if I were to take uh, <coughs> annual average of the wind, it turns out to be weaker than the uh, seasonal cycle, the annual wind for example, the annual cycle of the wind. That is stronger than the mean wind in the northern part of the Indian Ocean. That is not true of the Pacific or the Atlantic. So these are the winds. Um, let's look at the Indian Ocean now. Rainfall in winds in January, you see convergence into this high rainfall band, which is where you will have the low pressure and high temperatures. And uh, the winds over the North Indian Ocean are now blowing from the northeast at the surface. This is the so called northeast monsoon. In July, it swung around. You still have the southeast straits, as you did here. You have southeast straits and sequel in the northeast straits, as you do in the other basins. In July, you still have the southeast straits, they cross the equator. The Coriolis acceleration now deflects the wind to the west, to the right. And uh, <coughs> instead of being deflected to the left as in the southern hemisphere, now the deflection is to the right. And instead of being southeasterlies, they are now southwesterlies. Because the convergence has to be into this uh, high rainfall region in the Bay of Bengal. That is like a big vacuum pump sucking in there right across from the southern hemisphere. So that is what you see. And that's why you have southwesterly winds. So if you were to average out the winds between July and January, the mean wind would be small. And if I were to take the harmonic at the 360 day period, that would turn out to be the strong component, unlike in the Pacific. <clears throat> so when you look at the Indian Ocean, you end up having to show a few panels in order to describe the wind forcing. So this is the seasonally reversing wind stress from a recent climatology by Josie et al. It's also called the Southampton Oceanographic Center or SOC climatology. <coughs> Earlier climatologies were coarser. The Hellman climatology, Hellman and Rosenstein climatology in 1982 was at on a two degree grid. This is on a one degree grid. But those are the kind of data available earlier. And what was available to Walter Monk was uh, probably comparable, but not as reliable and uh, maybe even coarser because you are talking of a much vaster expanse in the Atlantic. And ships typically don't go all over the basin. They go in certain shipping lanes. So you're not going to have very good data from all over the basin to be able to compute a reliable wind stress and therefore a reliable wind curve. So when we look at the seasonal reversing wind stress in the North Indian Ocean, you have the northeasterlies replaced by the southwesterlies. <coughs> Now, of interest to us is some uh, peculiarities of the wind, which is a consequence of geography. If you look at uh, the east coast of India, part of it is basically aligned southwest to northeast. If you look at the west coast of India, it goes the other way around. So, when you look at the winds in the Arabian Sea, they tend to blow into the Indian coast, while when you look at the Bay of Bengal, the wind blows more along the coast. So though you can see that the wind vectors are larger in the Arabian Sea than in the Bay, which means that the mean wind associated with this strong southwesterly flow, which is called the Finlater jet or low-level jet, 
<coughs> is uh, stronger in comparison to the July wind over the bay. When you look at the alongshore component, it turns out that the winds are stronger of the east coast of India in comparison to what you see of the west coast of India. That's just a consequence of geography and the alignment of the coast. There's one more thing that happens. When you look at the east coast of India, the northeasterlies or southwesterlies, they blow along the coast largely and therefore the wind changes direction with season. When you look at the west coast of India, it's a little different. <clears throat> For most of the west coast, irrespective of whether you're looking at January or July, when you look at the longshore component of the wind, it turns out that it goes from pole to equator. And the reason we are interested in the longshore component is uh, basically Ekman and geostrophic flows. If I have a <coughs> uh, wind blowing along this uh, coast out here, if I have a wind blowing towards you, then Ekman transport will be to the right in the northern hemisphere. So the flow will be away from the coast. And to balance the mass, water has to come up from below, and sea level has to drop at the coast. That is a pelic. Water comes up from below. That is the sign that you take. So the vertical velocity below is positive because that z-axis is positive upward. <clears throat> if instead I had the wind blowing towards me along this coast, which is an east, uh, which is the western boundary, if I have the wind blowing towards me in the northern hemisphere, the flow will be to the right again into the coast. At the coast again, the current has to go to zero. So mass balance demands that there be downwelling. So the thermocline or the picnocline goes down and sea level rises at the coast. Once sea level changes at the coast, if it goes up at the coast, <coughs> in comparison to what happens offshore, you will get a geostrophic current set up because of that. If the sea level goes down at the coast, you will get a geostrophic current set up because of that. So there is Ekman flow into and away from the coast, off, onshore and offshore, <coughs> that sets up a sea level pressure gradient across uh, coast or shore pressure gradient that drives longshore geostrophic current. That is why we are interested in the longshore component of the wind stress. If, on the other hand, you were to look at the cross shore component of the wind stress, the Ekman flow will be along the coast and it does not lead to similar pressure gradients and therefore to strong flows. That is why in oceanography, when you are looking at uh, <coughs> these coastal circulations, you'll always find people looking at the longshore wind, which, though weaker in the bay, as far as the mean July winds are concerned, the longshore wind turns out to be stronger. And that's shown here, of Vizag, Vishakhapatnam, the wind changes direction, that's the longshore wind, and <coughs> it uh, does not do so of Mormukau. Of Mormukau, we have plotted two curves here. The blue curve is for the coast and the red curve is for the shelf break. The reason that has been done is if you look at the topography in the Bay of Bengal, the shelf is very narrow. So it doesn't really matter whether I look at the coast or the shelf, shelf break. So only one curve is enough. But when I look at uh, the west coast of India, the shelf is uh, already over 100 kilometers wide at uh, Goa, which means if I use quick scat uh, data, scatometer data, I have four pixels. It's a quarter degree record that you get. <coughs> and on Mumbai, it's something like 200 kilometers uh, wide. So there is going to be a difference between the coastal wind and the shelf break wind. The alignment of the coast also differs. At Mumbai, the coast is more or less north-south. While if you look at the shelf break, it is almost at 45 degrees. So of interest to us is what happens at the shelf break. We are not so much interested in the coastal wind. We are interested in the shelf break because, as I said, we are going to be looking at the current on the slope. For us, the coast is a vertical, the slope is a vertical wall, and we basically shift the coast outward to fill in the entire shelf. We are looking at the slope currents. At Murmugao, irrespective of which one you look at, the coastal wind or the shelf break wind, they don't change direction. There is a change in magnitude with uh, season, <coughs> but uh, there is no change in direction. In spite of the southwesterlies and northwesterlies, there's a change in direction across the Arabian Sea, but not in the climatological seasonal cycle of the wind of the west coast of India. 
that is unidirectional. Okay. <coughs> so maybe we should close here because I have just too many slides to look at. And I don't want to do that uh, today. I don't have much time for that. So if there are any questions, we'll take them. Otherwise, uh, we meet, uh, unfortunately, not next week because I'm not here. Uh, we probably meet the week after that. So I'm not here till the 8th. We'll have to meet on the 10th. That's Monday, uh, 10th afternoon. <coughs> 10th afternoon, 4 o'clock. Hmm? So 11th. 11th at uh, 10 o'clock. So we'll see what is the consequence of this uh, <coughs> afternoon, 4 o'clock. Pardon? No. Tomorrow I have a wife. Okay. Inquiries? Any questions? Uh, we meet on the 11th, Monday, not next week. Next week I'm not around. On Monday at 4 p.m. And is it, is it possible to uh, better the audio clarity? Because the clarity is not very good over here. Maybe because of internet issues or whatever issues I don't understand. But... Uh, is it different today from yesterday? Not really, not much. Because I saw the broadcast on YouTube yesterday and that was okay. YouTube so I am puzzled. Okay. I mean, we'll check out over email with Minakshi to see if she had similar problems. And then let's uh, see what can be done. Okay, okay. Okay then. Okay then. Yeah. yeah.